Prager. I'm a professor of psychology at Colorado State University uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado. Here I have two roles that intersect a lot. One is uh, teaching in the psychology department. I'm also in heavily involved in our doctoral program in industrial organization psychology. And I'm also the director of an online master's program in IO psychology, so helping students that don't want the PhD find careers in IO. Uh, so I think like a lot of undergraduate majors, uh, I wanted to go into counseling psychology. Uh, that's what got me excited or interested initially. And I stayed interested in that uh, through my junior year, although I was starting to wonder if kind of that was a good fit for kind of the person I was. And then in my junior year, I took a class called Industrial Psychology. Uh, this was at the University of Cincinnati. And it was from an educational psychologist named Len Lansky. And I mentioned that he's an educational psychologist because it turns out that the class had very little to do with industrial psychology. Um, it was kind of Len's take on what that was. But it was, and I guess I would kind of characterize it as maybe a class in small groups communication. But it was just a lot of fun. He would give us uh, supervisor uh, problems. We would form groups. One of us would role play a supervisor, try to solve them. We would debrief. And it was just a lot of fun kind of problem solving, applying what we knew about human behavior to the workplace. So that's what got me excited. And I was actually, um, <laughs> I was pretty shocked when I got to graduate school uh, and found out that it had nothing to do with um, with IO Psych, uh, or what I'd learned really didn't have much to do with the, what uh, the, what you're learning about uh, uh, with this textbook. But there's a couple of other ironies that I wanted to mention. One is uh, that Len, when he was a graduate student, he went to the University of Michigan at the University of Michigan, and part of his funding was to code thematic aid perception TAT tests for uh, John Atkinson and David McClelland. Um, and I actually did my thesis in graduate school uh, using TAT, and through that I discovered kind of lends his uh, uh, academic background. Uh, the other is that the book that we used was a book called The Role Play Technique by Norman F. Meyer. Um, and uh, Meyer was, this book was one of the most popular uh, training books, kind of hands-on training books in the 60s, and that's kind of where I wound up making my mark in training. Sure. So, um, and actually I do a fair amount of consulting, uh, primarily with training managers, but I'm thinking about the question more kind of managers in general, maybe a HR director. And I think there's kind of three levels to the answer. The obvious, and I <laughs> I wouldn't say this is the obvious answer. Uh, that's a little bit insulting, but the obvious answer to me is that we know from research in strategic human resource management that bundling, putting together uh, selection, training, performance management, job analysis, the kind of those core HR practices, that bundling them, having them talk to each other and kind of get, all get at the same, uh, the same themes, competencies, abilities, and so forth. There's a plenty of research that shows that that's related to organizational effectiveness. So the more your training is aligned with uh, training practices, with selection and so forth, the more effective your organization is. Uh, kind of related to that, maybe a little bit less obvious, is that uh, one of the things you learn through uh, job analysis, needs analysis is that as you start um, as you start uncovering skills and abilities uh, that are necessary to do the job as you start identifying performance gaps that may exist there are skills and abilities that you can probably best assess um, and hire for uh, there are performance gaps that you could probably uh, uh, best address through some type of performance management feedback system but in the end there's just going to be some things some knowledge some skills uh, that the best way to get at, the best way to ensure that, that, that your workforce has that knowledge and skills is going to be tra training. So it's really essential to certain skills and knowledge within the organization. And I think the least obvious, um, but we see this more and more in today's workforce, is that many workers, and, and in particular younger workers, are just hungry for knowledge. Uh, people like to grow, uh, they like to learn, and so um, one of the things, for example, I find in my consulting practice is is that when you provide more opportunities for training and professional development, uh, that's a really great way of building organizational commitment loyalty. So besides getting the benefits of people who can do their jobs, uh, you now have much more committed uh, employees and, and you're going to attract more employees to people who are coming to your organization, skilled workers for those development opportunities. 
part of what I try to do uh, in my research is really try to keep up on what's going on in basic cognitive and experimental psychology uh, and figure out how, how can we apply that to design better classrooms, uh, better training programs, and so forth. So within that realm of, say, instructional psychology, there's a set of findings uh, by a, a UCLA uh, professor, Robert Bjork, um, and he labels this effect that he calls the, uh, the desirable difficulties effect. And what Bjork says is that when you're designing instruction, any form of instruction, classroom, tr uh, corporate training, whatever, uh, there's a sweet spot in which increasing the difficulty of the training is going to eventually improve retention, transfer, learning. And after you get past that sweet spot, uh, the training could be a little bit too difficult. So in some of his other writings, um, uh, Bjork refers to this as the Goldilocks principle. Uh, you want you don't want training to be too hard. You don't want it to be too easy, but you want it to be just right. But I think the important thing to understand here is that just right has a certain edge of difficulty to it. Um, if I make training too simple, uh, people are going to space out. They're not going to pay attention. If I make it too difficult, concepts are over their head. And then the other really important piece of this is the notion that when training is a little bit difficult, how do we solve difficult problems? We exert effort. So we think about it. We concentrate. We focus. And so by building in this level of difficulty into the training content, uh, what we're doing is we're encouraging learners to kind of step up their game and get to the point uh, where they're exer exerting uh, exactly the level of effort we need for them to retain the information. So three best practices of training. I think the first and fundamental one is that measurement matters. Uh, when uh, managers who are responsible for running and, and managing training programs uh, oftentimes will neglect either upfront needs assessment or post-training evaluation. There's only so much time and the focus is on uh, trying to get make sure that we have uh, uh, butts in the seats, people in the classroom learning as much as they can. The problem with that is that because training is a scarce resource, we only have so much time uh, to send people to training, uh, so much uh, opportunities for deliver, it's difficult to, or expensive to deliver training material. We want to be really strategic uh, about the types of training that we offer. And so without this upfront measurement, uh, we may be spending a lot of our time, a lot of our resources on training that uh, people don't know, uh, don't need to know. And likewise, without the evaluation at the end, we may be perpetuating ineffective training practices, things that don't work. Uh, we may be spending too much time on training. And so the idea of, of measurement matters is simply that um, we can really hone the training that we're doing to the right things. Secondly, in terms of the training content itself, uh, this is not going to shock you, uh, but there's plenty of research, plenty of science that shows that probably the two most important characteristics to any effective skill training, not necessarily knowledge, but skill training, is uh, providing opportunities for practice and feedback. Um, in terms of practice, we want to create a relatively safe environment so people can try out new skills without, you know, uh, driving a bulldozer off a road or, or making a critical mistake. And similarly, we want to be able to correct errors as soon as possible and point out uh, positive effects to let people know when they're doing things right so they can repeat. So building in practice and feedback. And the third gets back to this concept of desirable difficulties. What we want to be able to do is uh, figure out ways of building challenge into the training program. Um, you've sat in a class where you've been bored, you've sat back, you've uh, been looking at your computer or your phone, or maybe you were engaged, you see people around you and, and, and they're not engaged, and it's a really difficult learning climate. So um, there's we can entertain the trainee, but really the best thing to do is lay out reasonable challenges given their level of, of development and then kind of encourage them to overcome those challenges through learning. Sure. So here's here's my advice for the learner. First is I do think any training opportunities you get, you should take advantage of it, uh, particularly early in your career. It's a little bit easier to think this is what I'm going to be doing for a long period of time. But the reality is uh, we change jobs, we change gigs, we move within our career. And the more learning you can pick up at any point in time, the better off you're going to be in the future. The more options you have, the more options you have, um, the better off you are. But 
I think the primary point that I want to make here is that um, none of us should assume that we are a good learner. Uh, the assumption that we are a good learner, I think, comes from kind of two places. One is we've made it this far, so we must be a good learner. And, and secondly, uh, other psychological research shows that we tend to over over evaluate our abilities in most most areas. The truth is, and there's plenty of research uh, in, in educational psychology, um, cognitive psychology, the truth is that most of us are actually pretty inefficient learners. Uh, that's the majority. So um, you're more likely, probability says you're more likely in the inefficient learner than, than the efficient learner. One of the things I was just thinking about the other day, I don't know how I got onto this, but I asked myself how many times in all the roles that I've had, an un, uh, undergraduate student, graduate student, uh, college professor, small business owner, department chair, parent, uh, how many times have I uh, gone to someone, identified someone who's really good within that role and say, tell me your secrets. And as I thought about it, I realized probably only once early in my uh, time as a parent, I had no idea what I was doing, called my mom up and said, tell me, teach me, how did you do it? But in general, maybe it's just me, but I think in general, I never sat down and, 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 and picked the brain of someone who was really effective. So that would be the advice that I would give you. Even if you think you're doing things well, there's all different ways in which people learn. There's all different types of tricks and strategies. So I'd encourage you to find some really effective learners, um, maybe other undergraduates, maybe graduate students who uh, you have an opportunity to work with professors and say, teach me how to learn, make me a better learner. Uh, the other piece of this I'd recommend is you could do some online learning or book reading on this too. There's a terrific book uh, called Making It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, written by a couple of cognitive psychologists. And it's really all, what do we know about the science of learning and how we can use that to be better learners uh, in our everyday life. So um, I'd recommend, recommend that approach.